come broken to be healed, I come wounded to be healed. And I am accepted just as I am. Praise the Lord. Amen. Today I want us to read from Judges. Judges chapter 11. And I will read from verses 1 to 10. Then verse 29. Judges chapter 11, 1 to 10. Then verse 29. Jephthah the Gilite, Gilatite, was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when they grew up, they drove Jephthah away. You are not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a group of adventurers gathered around him and followed him. Sometime later, when the Ammonites made war on Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah, Jephthah from the land of Tob, Come, they say, be our commander, so we can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, Didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you are in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to him, Nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us to fight the Ammonites, and you will be our head over all who live in Gilead. Jephthah answered, Suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them to me. Will, will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, The Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them, and he repeated all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Verse 29. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. He crossed Gilead, and Manasseh passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and came there. He advanced against the Ammonites. The word of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank you. We thank you because you call us just as we are. We thank you, Father, because you do not judge us by our past, our history, by what we do. But, Father, we thank you because you accept us even in spite of our wickedness, our disobedience, you still call us to us to you. We thank you, Father, because we know that we are who we are today because of you. I pray thee, O oh Lord, that the meditations of my heart, the words of my mouth, we bring healing and peace to your people, and we honor your name. For we have prayed to thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know what the Bible means to you, but this is what I know it means to me. This is the lamb on my path. The Bible is the lamb to my path and the light I need for my everyday life. I don't know what it means to you, but to me, when I have problems, I go back to the Bible because the Bible is real. It's not just about God's work in our lives. It's also about the damage we cause to one another and how God comes back every moment to redeem us. So you want to talk about life? Go back to your Bible. Read your Bible. You will see life. You will see family dynamics. And today we are being presented how one person's sin 
has caused a, an entire trauma in another person's life and has led that person to a lifestyle that he never chose and to a certain traumatic pain that he never asked for. So they were presented with the life of a family, the family of Gilead, a man who went outside his marriage vows to sleep with a prostitute. It's not strange in our world today that in marriage life, people cheat on each other. It's not a new thing, but it happened. And this man had, this prostitute had a child, and he took, this, this man, Gilead, took the child back home. He accepted his responsibility, but then he had other children at home from his legal marriage. And when Jephthah was brought home, and the sons grew up, they revolted against this child of a prostitute. I don't want to talk about the pain of the wife at home. I don't want to talk about the, the pain of the other woman. But I just want us to focus on what we have read. When Jephthah grew up, his brothers came back and said, you cannot be a part of our inheritance because you do not belong to this family. You are a child of a prostitute. You are not legally our, our brother. And they rejected Jephthah, and Jephthah could not handle the heat. It's one against four sons. He couldn't handle the heat, and he left. He did not just leave Gilead, the town, he went to another town. And in that town, he had to survive as a youth. And so the Bible said that people, scoundrels, they called them scoundrels, other people joined him. Probably they identified with his pain of rejection. Probably they identified with his pain of abandonment, the loneliness that he might have felt because he was rejected by his stepbrothers. The sins of the parents will always affect the children. And the Bible says that God shall punish the fathers of the, God shall punish up to the fourth generation of those who do what? Who trust in him. And we begin to see how the sin of a father is making another child go through a traumatic experience, shame and guilt of his mother, which he never asked for. And we seated here today. We have stories to tell. We have pain and suffering of rejection and guilt, of shame that might have occurred consciously or unconsciously because of how we were treated growing up. Some of us carry these burdens into our graves because we have never been able to speak it out. We've never been able to talk to somebody. We've never been able to bring it at the foot of the cross. And this shame and guilt we carry, the pain of rejection and abandonment by those you thought would protect you, by those you thought would love you, we begin to act differently. Sometimes it takes us away from God because we begin to tell ourselves, if God really did exist, why did they do this to me? If God really existed, why did they suffer me so much? Where is God in my suffering? Where is God when I was being maltreated, abused, molested? Where was God? And sometimes, sometimes, this traumatic experience takes us away from God. It blinds us from seeing God. And in Jephthah's, Jephthah's case, Jephthah just left, and the Bible said he did his thing. Whatever thing Jephthah did, he had to survive. But whatever thing Jephthah did, it gave him power and respect in wherever, whenever his name was mentioned. And when the Israelites needed somebody to save them from the hands of the Ammonites, because they, they have sinned against God, and the Ammonites have taken over the, their, their land, and the Ammonites, the Israelites, did not have a leader to, to lead them in battle. And they remember Jephthah. And they came to Jephthah. They rejected child. 
the abandoned child, the maltreated child. They came back to Jephthah in his adult life and they pleaded with Jephthah, come and fight with us. Jephthah has made a name for himself. His trauma has pushed him to make a name for himself. It might not be the perfect name, but he has made a name for himself. He was remembered as a most, as a good warrior by the people. His background did not define him. He carried the burdens of rejection, the burdens of pain, but those burdens did not stop him from making a name to himself. What does that tell us? We have no excuse. You have no excuse to not grow, to not excel in whatever thing you are doing just because you feel like you have a traumatic pain. You have no excuse. You can make it. But when the Israelites came and pleaded with Jephthah, Jephthah was a wise man. The Bible said he was wise, a wise king. He negotiated, if I fight this war with you, you will make me your leader. That was wisdom. He will not be rejected the second time. Now Jephthah had the powers to take control of his life. When he was a child, when he was a youth, he did not have the powers to take control of his life. But now that he's in the midst of the elders as an elder and known as a good warrior, the best in his time, he had the powers to take back that which was him, his, and he negotiated. If I fight this war with you, you will make me your leader. And the elders were so desperate and they accepted. And he challenged the elders, you rejected me, why come to me? It's not so much about the pain, it's what you do with the pain that makes the difference, that changes your life. Very often we use the pain for evil. Because this happened to me, I start doing it on other people. Sometimes the victim becomes the perpetrator. Why? Because you feel like you want to revenge. Chapter is telling us we don't need to do that. Japheth is telling us that we can make something good out of our lives. And when the elders came to him, he said, I will be your king, and I know myself, I will lead you. But you have to promise me in front of God that when I win this battle, you will make me king. He restored himself. He used his pain. He used the wisdom of the past. He used everything that he once knew and had known in his experience and restored his dignity in the midst of the people. And the Bible says the Lord was with him. The Spirit of God in the midst of the battle came upon him. So that tells me that somewhere in the life of Jephthah, Jephthah knew God. He did not allow his pain, his pain to, to blind him from knowing God. He did not allow the traumas of his life to blind him from knowing God. He did not allow trouble, trouble, struggles of life to blind him from knowing God. And he told the Israelites, we will make it, you will say this in front of God all over again. And verse 29 says, the spirit of God, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. Rejected and abandoned. Broken and mistreated. Wounded in every aspect that you can imagine. But God chose him. God chose him to be the leader. God chose him to guide his people. God chose him to restore Israelite. God chose him to restore his father's household. Broken, rejected, abandoned, but yet God chose him. Why? Because he was faithful to God. Why? Because he did not allow his pain to blind him from the presence of God, to blind him from the knowledge of God. And when we continue to read, if you read the entire Judges 11, you can tell that Jephthah knew his story. He knew the story of the Israelites and God. He might have been the prostitute 
son, but he knew the story of the Israelites. And when it came time to negotiate, he told of the story of how God had led the Israelites to occupy that land. And the Ammonites have no business in that land. He knew his roots. Brothers and sisters, we are humans in the world. And we will continually make mistakes if we are not careful. If we do not live a spirit-filled life, we will continually make mistakes. And our mistakes or sins, we continually hurt those who are around us. Continually. It will hurt those who are around us. We might feel rejected by the same people we love. The same people that have to protect us. The same people that have to guide us and lead us and embrace us and protect us from the world. We might feel rejected by them. We might feel abandoned by them. And, the, and those childhood, tra childhood traumas may continue to eat into our hearts, may continue to eat into our minds. It might lead to depression. It might lead to all kinds of problems. It might lead to anger. These feelings are real. If there is the fruit of the spirit, joy, peace, happiness, I need for you to begin to understand that when the spirit is not in you, there's the other side, anger, sadness. And these things are real. But the Bible is telling us that we can bring these things, this this negative emotions, these traumatic feelings are the fruit of Calvary because the Spirit of God is upon us. Japheth did not have to do anything, but God located him. Sometimes you don't have to do anything. God is already there. God is already there in that pain, in that situation you find yourself. God is already there. What we need to do is just to open up. What we need to do is just to admit that we are, we are hurting. It's just to admit that humans may not be able to solve the traumatic difficult problems we are going through, the emotional turmoil we are going through. Humans may not be able to solve it. We have to admit that sometimes shame and guilt may make us to hide our pain because we don't want the next person to know. We don't want your, you don't want your neighbors to know because it's so shameful. But God, God says, come to me. Come to me just as you are, with that pain. Open up to me just as you are, with that pain, with that shame, and I will heal you. I will give you healing. And that is the faith we stand, I stand upon. That is what Christ did on the cross for us. That he took upon himself our shame, that we can find healing. He took upon, upon himself our guilt that we shall be free and liberated. Mercy and grace bought our freedom. When you are in emotional distress, you have no freedom. When you are ashamed of your past, of your story, of the events that happened to your life, you have no freedom. You are held in bondage. Jephthah had to carry the shame of his mother. He had to carry the shame of his father. He had to carry that. But that did not blind him, blind him from coming to God. He was not blinded by that. And we too must not be blinded by that. Let go. Let go of that hurt feeling. Let go of that shame that holds you bondage, that dictates your life that dictates everything you do, that makes you turn around and see another person and you cannot trust them, that makes you look at that, that loving husband, that loving wife, and wonder if you can trust again. Let go. And let God. Therapy is good. I do a lot of therapy. A lot. Because I work every day, I work with people who are sick. People who have a lot of difficulties in their life. I meet more than 30 patients a day. I hear pain and suffering constantly. Five days of the week when weekend is coming, I'm like, thank God. 
and I pray nobody calls me to come for any emergency in the hospital. But I listen to people's pain, how illness brings out those traumatic life events, how illness generates shame and guilt, how illness brings out childhood difficulties that they thought they had forgotten, but what they have done is just repressed. And at the end of the day, there are some stories I hear, some stories of pain and suffering that eat into me, that awakens into me a certain burden. And yes, I need therapy. But no matter how many therapists I see, this remains my therapy. This remains my best therapy. Because I can still go back in the Bible, and this Bible shall continually be the light on my path. It will continually be the lamb that guides my way. Because no matter how much therapy I have, it's limited. It's limited. So I go back to my God. My God who understands shame. My God who understands guilt. My God who understands childhood trauma. Do you know Jesus had childhood trauma? Being born and being taken to Egypt, do you know what that means? That at the day of your birth, somebody is not happy? A king is not happy? And people are being Children of your age are being killed and your parents have to run with you in a foreign country and you become an immigrant? Do you know how, how traumatic that could be? And that is why Jesus understood compassion. That is why he understood empathy because he knew what it means to be rejected by your own people. He knew what it means to be in pain. He knew what it means to live in shame. The biggest shame of all, the shame on the cross to be stripped naked and be nailed on the cross. What, shame, what other shame can you say about it? So our God understands. He understands the pain we are going through. He understands the struggles we go through. He understands everything that happens to us. And that is why no matter what happens to me, I always go back to the Bible. I always go back to my God. I always go back to the foot of Calvary because at Calvary, I can meet with somebody who understands human suffering and who shall not judge me and who shall not condemn me because of the pain I'm feeling. That is my Jesus. And that is the Jesus I'm presenting to you today. A God who is able to understand your struggles because he too knows what it means to have traumatic life experiences, to have emotional distress. He too knows what it means to be abandoned, to be rejected, to be alienated, to be isolated. He too knows suffering. But he has overcome all the sufferings so that we can have freedom. So when Jephthah, when the Spirit of God came upon Jephthah, God restored him. When you read the entire passage, God restored, gave, he gave victory to Jephthah and restored Jephthah. And the Bible says the spirit of God was upon Jephthah. Jephthah was restored. Many times when we think about restoration, we think about restoration meaning that God will place us back on the same position that we find ourselves. Right? When God restores us, what does that mean? That he's lifting us up to put us back in the same position. No. When God restores you, when he restores us, he's taking us to another level, to a higher level of functioning, a higher level of being, because in that level, that is where he wants us to be. That is the blessing. God cannot restore us to the same position that led us into trouble. God rests us, us to a position that is higher. So when the Spirit of God came upon Jephthah, he was not taking Jephthah just back into his father's house. He was taking him to be king of an entire nation, king over his father's house. So no, God restores. When God restores, he restores us to a higher level. 
So your restoration today is not to put you back in the same position that caused the pain. It's for you to be in a higher level where the world will see that you are indeed a child of God. That the world will see that you are indeed the person that God has called you to be. But when you are restored, it also calls for a mindset. It calls for transformation. It calls for you to be able to renew your minds. God does not restore you to have the same mindset. God does not restore you to think the same. When God restores you, he calls you. He says, renew your mind. Be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. Do not conform. Jephthah had to let go of his conformity. Whatever this conformity may be, he had to let go. And the Bible was clear. When the, when the Israelite elders met him, this is how you know that Jephthah began to have a renewed mindset. He met him and the elders had to speak in front of God. They had to declare that he will be king in front of God. That was a renewed mindset. Because when, before then, he never did anything in front of God. He was just going about his life. But when the elders met him, he said, you will say these things in front of God. And they did. And the spirit of God was with him. So when we put God first in our sufferings, when we put God first in our joy, when we put God first in our struggles, we shall be restored. And when you are restored, God is asking you not to go back to your vomit, but be renewed. So we have work. It's not just you being restored. It's also you being renewed. You cannot go back. Jephthah could not go back to just being a vagabond. He couldn't. He has to be renewed. And he was such a good leader that he was remembered when people of faith in Hebrews were being mentioned. Jephthah's name was being mentioned. Amen? So whatever struggles you are going through today, whatever childhood traumas that might have been guiding your life up to now, that has been interfering in your everyday life, in your everyday relationship, Whatever thing it may be, whatever shame and guilt that, is, that you're carrying as a burden with your everyday life and hiding behind fine clothes, good jobs, good cars, God is telling you, open up, come to me. Come to me, and I will give you healing, just as you are. Just as you are, come to me and open up, and I will give you healing. So the healing begins with us doing what? Accepting that we have scars, accepting that we have burdens, accepting that we face rejection, we face shame, accepting that we are broken, we are wounded. It can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be spiritual. Accepting that we have these things happening in our lives is the first step of your healing. The problem is that sometimes we do not accept Sometimes we do not accept that we are broken. Sometimes we do not accept that we need help. Accepting that we need help is the one step for healing. Then when we know that we need help, then we begin to take concrete steps, concrete steps to come to God just as we are. It calls for a lot of courage. It calls for a lot of vulnerability to begin to talk about that pain that you've hidden for so many years, to begin to talk about that pain that you've been hiding behind, to begin to to open up. It takes a lot of courage to be vulnerable. But it is in that vulnerability that God begins to do his work, that God begins to heal. And that is why when we are sick, we go to the hospital. Right? And when you go to the hospital, there are certain things in the hospital that I don't like. If I can avoid it, I will avoid it. But when you go to the hospital, the doctor has to do his job. So they give you this beautiful gown <laughs> with a good view behind. 
because he needs access to your body to do his work. It's very vulnerable. When you have emotional trauma, you see a therapist. It's very, very vulnerable to sit in the, in the front of a stranger and begin to pour out your heart, your story of pain and suffering. It's very vulnerable. When you have emotional pain, spiritual pain, it's very vulnerable to come in front of the pastor, in front of the church, in front of your God, and say, God, I have sinned. It's vulnerable. But it is in that vulnerability that healing is found. It is in that vulnerability and the admittance of being wounded that you begin to get your healing. You begin to get your freedom. So one step is to talk. Talk out your problems. Get the courage. God has given us the courage to speak out our truth. He's given us a voice to speak out our truth because it is in speaking out our truth that we begin to find healing. So brothers and sisters, children of God, what pain are you carrying today? What burden are you carrying? It might not even be your burden. It might be the burden of a child, a burden of a grandchild. What are these burdens? The Bible says bring them to God because we serve a God that can heal. We serve a God that understands. We serve a God that can restore. So bring them to God. Just as they are, bring them to God. Don't judge them. Bring them to God. Don't hide them. Bring them to God. And God will restore. That which is broken, that which is wounded, he will restore. And when God restores, he invites us to give him the glory. He invites us to give the testimony. He invites us to continue to grow in him and through him. He invites us to continue to renew our minds and to continue to be faithful in him because without him, you cannot move forward. Without him, even when you are restored, you still need him. Jephthah was a good leader because as a leader, he needed God all the time. Until the day he died, he needed God. So when God restores us, he still expects us to continue to do the work, to continue to renew our minds. But we have to do it not only with God, we have to do it in community because we have to support one another in the healing process, in the growing process. We have to learn to support each other when the time comes. So a few weeks back, I was, I was not in church for almost a month. I was very sick. Not for, I was sick for, for, out of four months, I was sick for almost one and, a half, one and a half weeks. And during that period, I didn't come to church. But it was so healing. The first person who called me was Sister, um, where is she? There she is behind, I've forgotten her name. <laughs> Faye. <laughs> Sister Faye was the first one who called me. And she's like, Ever since your ordination, I haven't seen you. Where were you? And she could tell from my voice that I was very sick. But it felt so healing in, on that sick bed, struggling for my health, struggling to breathe, struggling to eat. It felt so healing. Then Sister Adele called. Where were you? It felt so healing. I, feel, I told them, I, it's so good to be remembered. It's so good to be seen. It's so good to be missed. Then other people called. You know yourself. They called. Then yesterday, as I was driving, it dawned on me I haven't seen, <laughs> I haven't seen Sister Esperanza. And I called her. And she's responding on the hospital bed. In the hospital, I'm like, what are you doing in the hospital? I didn't know you were sick. But it felt so good even to me to call her on the hospital bed, though she was being discharged, but it felt like a win. 
that she's been discharged. She's still in the hospital, and I am giving her this call to check on her. That is God at work. That is God teaching me that when people are not seen, we have the responsibility to see them. When he is restoring people back to health, we have the responsibility to support them. When people are struggling and they are trying to transform their life and transform their mindset and renew their minds, we have a responsibility to stand by them. That is faith in communion. That is faith in restoration. That is faith in God. And that is faith in healing. So today we are being welcomed, not just to restore our lives, but to realize that the restoration continues in community, in communion with people who have faith and with people who can support us because it's a const constant battle. It's a constant call to be renewed, to be transformed, to be restored. Amen? Amen. So whatever you might be going through, Wherever God is restoring you to, just know that you are not alone. You are not alone. You have a whole lot of people around supporting you. A lot of people who just need for you to be open your mouth and say, I need help, and you shall be helped. So as we continue in, the, in Christ and we continue to fight the battles of the war, I just need to, you to remember that your God is with you. God is with you. And he's, he's, he walks through others to make himself manifest. You are not alone. So may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, may he heal you in your struggles and restore you back to wholeness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.